Good afternoon, Shweta. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? I did try and rehearse just before, but just in case. Yes, that's absolutely correct. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you for making the time to speak with me today. You are from India and based in India at the moment. Do you want to share with us a little bit about yourself, maybe three words or three numbers, or just a brief intro about who you are? Um, thank you, Sebastian. Um, so I work as uh, an applied scientist at a, a new banking startup in India called Jupiter. And if I have to describe myself in, I would choose numbers maybe. I would say zero, one, because I like binary, and eight, because rotated eight is infinity, just for no particular reason. <laughs> well, that's uh, interesting. Thank you for sharing. So you're a Google developer expert for the past two years, and this is gonna be on YouTube, so link in the description for those who wanna know what uh, the GDE program is all about. Do you want to share a little bit about your experience working with uh, the Google the Upper Expert program or working with Google Technologies? Um, sure. So um, my experience, um, you know, working with the Google Developer Expert program has been uh, quite rewarding in the sense that um, I anyway was enthusiastic about you know sharing my knowledge, whatever little that I've learned with the community. Um, the GDE program just gives me a platform to share it with like a wider audience and at the same time also learn from the community that's around me, the other GDEs and even collaborate with them on um, really cool projects that otherwise I wouldn't have that opportunity. So it's both ways for me, it has been that way. And working with Google Technologies, of course, like, I mean, my bread and butter is machine learning. So I use TensorFlow quite often. Um, I really like the detailedness um, about TensorFlow tutorials. It's very easy for anyone to ramp up and start coding and, you know, just develop their first deep learning models. So, I mean, the experience has been pretty good there as well. And Another thing is that, you know, the ability to even sort of contribute there and even suggest um, because I'm a consumer of the, the product that has been developed by Google. I think that also gives you uh, a sort of an advantage and um, it just helps, you know, uh, create a better community and make and it, it's, it's kind of a more interactive relationship than just passive, I would say. So you talked about TensorFlow. Is there anything that surprised you when you were using TensorFlow in a good way or in a bad way? And if it's a bad way, we'll need to improve it. But in terms of maybe ease of use, you mentioned you found it fairly easy, but is there anything that surprised you specifically in one way or another, or maybe something that was particularly challenging? I'll just share like a small anecdote. So before using TensorFlow, like I did use TensorFlow since like 2017. So before TensorFlow 2.0 was launched, I was sort of always thinking whether should I go with TensorFlow 1.0 or whether should I just use Keras API. And then when TensorFlow 2.0 was launched and these two were sort of converged, I think it just made my life much easier. Cool. You mentioned you like sharing things and as an expert, this is, as you were saying, your bread and butter of learning, ingesting new things and sharing with others. So thank you for that. One of the reasons we're having this quick video interview today is because one of your blog posts, uh, which was written, I believe, three years ago, was selected as part of devlibrary.withgoogle.com. I'd like you to talk a little bit about it and share with us a little bit what reinforcement learning is all about and how it differs from different types of machine learning, whether supervised or unsupervised. So let's tease a little bit our viewers in terms of what is in the blog post and what are you talking about? Sure. So this blog post was written like back in 2018. I had just completed my master's in artificial intelligence. And I think I was sort of, you know, that excited kid who had just learned a lot of things. And for the first time, like when I started, um, you know, practicing ML, um, things like classification regression. So mostly supervised learning or maybe unsupervised learning were the things that people would generally talk about. But when I went and did like the core modules myself, like artificial intelligence and machine learning, I, I sort of discovered that there's also this another technique called reinforcement learning, um, which is different from supervised and unsupervised in a way that, you know, the agents learn through trial and error and there are rewards and punishments um, around the actions that you take. 
um, it's kind of similar to how like a child learns or um, and, and it's, it's very and because I'm sort of interested in gaming myself um, reinforcement learning is heavily applied to train um, agents who can play games themselves I myself um, wrote an algorithm to play a Pac-Man agent um, while I was in at my uni so I think I got just really excited about you know um, this whole um, space that I had done and I wanted I thought like you know it would, it would be a good thing that other people also come to know about it because when I asked my friends or maybe uh, my peers around in India and like even like across the world people were not really um, introduced to this concept so I thought like if I can maybe put it out in a blog in to, in a language and in a way which is easy to interpret and also provide like the actual resources out there so that if somebody wants to go deeper they can refer to the references it might be a good um, introductory blog for anyone who's who has heard like the buzzword which is reinforcement learning and then can uh, sort of progress from there in your blog post, you mentioned a number of use cases. Since you wrote that blog post three years ago, did you encounter different use cases? Would you like to share a little bit more about very practical examples of when reinforcement learning can be used? Sure. Um, I think, as I mentioned, um, robotics and gaming are, of course, uh, the practical use cases wherein reinforcement learning can be done. But I'm pretty sure that that's not... Um, mostly what most of the companies in the world do. So what are the other close to real world use cases would be one could be I think the stock trading algorithms. So if you are sort of um, because I myself I work in the fintech domain. Um, I can tell you that it, it kind of it, it is actually used now like practically it is being used for maybe portfolio management or um, just figuring out like you know um, even in case of uh, credit risk management right and credit risk prediction um, because essentially it's 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 like you're solving an optimization problem so in whichever industry or in whichever problem you feel like there's there's a scope of solving an optimization problem reinforcement learning might be a way to solve it but there are other cues through which you can spot like whether a problem can be solved by reinforcement learning or not so apart from that i think there are other use cases like traffic management as well um, but that's a bit more complicated because that will involve like multiple agents um, so if i have to actually tell you i feel like um Practically, you, uh, the, the use cases for reinforcement learning in the industry are low as compared to research, but it's sort of now taking, um, you know, um, its, its headway and, and, and it's kind of becoming more and more popular as people are actually testing and seeing that, you know, this is making a, a huge difference as compared to the traditional ML methods. You went into the field of machine learning and AI through your studies. You were mentioned this earlier. What would be your recommendation for developers who are curious about the field but have no experience? Uh, and they may be a bit afraid because they've been hearing that maybe you need a lot of statistics or mathematics or that it's daunting because you need to learn specific languages. What is your experience and what would you recommend to someone who's completely novice and has never practiced using TensorFlow or ML APIs? I think it's it's just um, like, you know, um, if you want to get into AI, ML, I feel like uh, just sort of go past the buzzwords and just start whatever you're curious with. Like if you are interested in images and if you're interested in image processing, start with that and then you can sort of weave your way around that. So, and always be curious, start from learning by actually doing projects. And there's a lot of knowledge to accumulate around that. And there are too many uh, concepts. It's not just coding, it's not just mathematics, it's not just statistics. There's, there's an amalgamation of different disciplines that sort of help make an AI system succeed. But the idea is that your curiosity will drive this whole, you know, effort of you learning something and eventually um, becoming like a practitioner in that field. And I, I don't think that there's a crash course that can teach you, but there are definitely tutorials that can help you start, you know, just get a quick start and get that instant gratification of like, you know, training a model. But then there's a long way. So if you're patient and if you're curious, I think it's it's a lot of fun as well. 
Is there a specific tutorial you have in mind or that you came across and you found particularly interesting? It doesn't have to be Google stuff, by the way. Uh, it can be anything that you came across. I'm forgetting the name. Oh yeah, it's Kevin Markham's uh, tutorial on you know getting started with Scikit-Learn because when I was doing my masters, um, I was using a lot of Python and MATLAB to code my assignments. But if somebody would ask me, like I, I don't think I had used, but I was actually doing it like you know I was training neural networks using NumPy. I was doing it from scratch, so um, I did not have formal training of Scikit-Learn. I think probably it was one of the earlier semesters, and uh, I think he he he's like one of the most patient persons to teach you how to get started with Scikit-Learn, which is like you know useful for if you are sort of starting with basic and traditional machine learning algorithms. So um, and of course, like uh, I mean, how can I forget like Andrew Ng's uh, courses, any courses like you know on course that I I still you know um, I'm, I'm I'm currently doing a course by him which is like ML in production. Um, so so I think um, there's there's a lot of clarity and there's a lot of structure in the way he teaches. So um, for concepts, I would recommend uh, Andrew Ng's courses and just for getting started with Scikit Learn, which is like you know baby steps if you want to start with ML. I would say Kevin Markham's tutorial. Excellent. Thanks for the recommendations. I'll put all of them in the description below. This is YouTube. Uh, you mentioned, and you were smiling when you said that, you mentioned that uh, you have an interest in gaming. Are you a game developer on the side? I know you work in fintech. Or are you a gamer? No, I'm more like wannabe gamer. Like that okay, was one of okay. my aspirations. So when I finished my undergrad, I think I wanted to be a game developer. But then life took its turn, and then eventually, from software developer, I became more of like an applied scientist. But yeah, I mean, maybe in a parallel universe, I would want to be a game developer. All right, all right. Any game that you play beyond Pac-Man? Um, of course. Um, so I've played Uncharted on PlayStation, and um, in general, I'm, I mean, of course, I played PUBG <laughs> until it was banned in India. And uh, currently, I'm playing uh, this really cool um, collaborative uh, game called It Takes Two. Okay, I have to check it out. Let's go back to machine learning. What is the worst piece of advice you've heard in the field of machine learning or when it comes to coding in general? Is there any piece of advice that you deem to be the worst thing you could hear in our field? Yeah. Uh... <laughs> Maybe not advice, but some people have like their own opinions or sort of like a way of looking at things. And people think that, you know, machine learning is all about import TensorFlow as TF or <laughs> import CycleLearn and, you know, just model.predict. And there's not much creativity or there's not much problem structuring that goes behind it. And also maybe... Um, it's not a worse piece of advice, but I feel like it's a contradictory advice if people say that, you know, um, just working on Kaggle projects or just competitions is going to, um, you know, help you sort of uh, progress in this field. I think if you really want to be like an actual scientist who knows end to end in terms of like right from um, structuring a business problem into an AI or ML problem and then um, sort of building systems that can be used on actual real devices. Um, then probably getting your hands dirty on real data and uh, also sort of exploring the data centric way of solving ML would be very helpful than just focusing on the model centric way, which I think Professor Andrew Ng also specifies in his recent talk. And that, that is something that I have practically experienced in the three years of experience that I've had working in this industry. A lot of the times just um, improving your data quality and structuring your data well has more benefits than you know spending a lot of time changing your algorithm or maybe just training a lot of models what excites you going forward is there a piece of technology that you're eager to play with and you haven't had the time yet or something you're looking forward to in terms of improvement in sdks and models and apis there's lots actually so i'm currently sort of evaluating like you know different ml platform tools because we're in a stage that we want to, so we've built a lot of models and we're ready to deploy them. But then how do you maintain those models and run the show? So I'm kind of exploring that area. And then I think it's it's kind of iterative and it's something that, you know, you're, you're sort of growing with the field itself. So I think for anything that you do, simply as like for data annotation or maybe just reviewing, there are ways to improve those steps in the ML lifecycle. 
so how do you just do everything efficiently in fact like one of the problems that i'm so, sort of encountering currently in my one of my projects is that um, given text data how do you even find like natural structures and uh, you know insights from that data if you don't have any labels so how do you even start about choosing the right data because uh, i think when you work for startups there are more constraints than when you work for bigger companies in in terms of like there's there's constraints on compute there's constraints on the performance that you want to achieve should be high but then the development time is really like you know it's sort of constricted so you have to develop fast and then also use less data but then good quality data so how do you sort of take care of all those constraints and still come up with something which can be um useful as well as consumer facing right so that's that's kind of tricky and and i'm very excited about like there's there's so many art different tools like i'm currently exploring polyxon also sort of airflow and kubeflow and um, i mean there are all, there's so many other uh, tools for just model experimentation also so i'm kind of um using and understanding what would work for me and like my organization better so that's what i've been busy with these days perfect any final few words you'd like to share with developers who are watching this video any words of encouragement or recommendations that you would have I mean I uh, yeah I'm always looking for inspiration myself but I feel like um this is one thing that I have to share I was really nervous when I was sharing this blog post because I felt like I'm not a good writer and maybe you know I'm just very poor at writing and nobody's going to read that and I was just a shame a shame to uh, share that but when I did that and it got a lot of traction it was very well received I think it gave me confidence to write more and uh, I wrote I mean although I haven't written published a lot of blogs right after that because I went straight into startups and that left me with very little bandwidth to actually write blogs I've been more into like you know um giving tutorials or talks uh but I think like this is one thing that I enjoy like creating content which is easy for people to understand and it works both ways so I think there is I, I wouldn't say that there is no selfish motive in doing that why do you want other people to learn i think it just helps you to get a grasp of your concepts well and it's like my own sort of notes right which are out there in public um so they are helping others and it's helping me also like if even if i forget something like oh uh, what were the applications for reinforcement learning you know commonly i can just refer to my own blog so um and you know refer to the links there so i feel like there's there's a larger incentive to do this than just um you know helping the community and it just i i feel like it's something that people should get over that stigma that whatever they've done is not good enough i think the more you share the better you'll get at it because you'll also get feedback so um just i mean everybody is out there doing projects and you know working on problems so maybe learning something uh don't learn in private try to learn in public as well Excellent. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and having gotten over the shame of thinking we're not good enough in writing something to share broadly your your knowledge. Thank you very much. Uh this is the end of our interview. If I'm not mistaken in Hindi, Danyavat. Yeah, that's yes, okay. You. Yeah, I'm trying to remember because it's been a while because of this pandemic I can't travel so I'm not on stage or talking to developers. So I forget my little my little cue words and my little words in foreign languages. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much.